Hi, thanks, Rowan. Um, do you have a dual citizenship? No, but I'm thinking I should probably get that actually before I spend any any lengthy time out any lengthy time out of the country. Yeah, you like you've got to come in every six months, or you lose your green card. I've got a green card. Oh, I see. So, how do you like Vegas? Are you, that must have taken some while uh, while to adapt to that. Like, um, was- uh, not not really. I I never used to like coming to Vegas years ago because kind of felt like you were just stuck in the desert and and mm. but i i like it now i mean vegas is a great place it's it's just like any other small town really it's like got suburbs and uh mm-hmm. have you have you been to vegas you've been to vegas have you no the closest i've been out to la uh, or to vegas i mean was um like california or arizona or you know but never vegas um I wouldn't mind checking yeah. it out, though. I wouldn't mind checking it out. At some point. Yeah, the, the the strip, well, the Vegas you see on television, that's just like the very middle part. It's a very small part. Oh, I see. Kind of like being and, Man- Yeah. Man- it's got that in just one section that's pretty much, you know, the main deal, and then the rest of it looks like shit. <laughs> well, I wasn't- <laughs> I wouldn't say Vegas looks like that, but yeah. Well, well, Vegas is like, as you probably know, it's like hundreds of miles of desert, of yeah. basically, and then just little teeny little, you know. So you had to, it. you had to move all the way from England to, to where did you originally go? Vegas or L.A.? Um, I originally. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, I, I I went to L.A. in 1989. And that's what the uh, yeah, and I was uh, seventeen. Yeah, so, mm. then, you know, I'm writing this book. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's important, you know, for people like us to to share our wisdom, and for people like you that have experienced what you have to share that, you know. Like, this is the way that it was. And when we were growing up, we didn't have internet, right? No, no, we didn't. No. Sorry, I'm doing a lot of talking, but I'm trying no, to... No, fine. You, it's fine. Yeah, it's a, whatever. It's all good. To, you know, I'll try to give you a, a, a foundation on all this where it comes mm. from. Um, you know, we didn't have internet. You know, what I was learning, it was like I learned from my guy next door or my, you know, one of my friends that would come over with a new riff or... Guitar magazine or guitar world or whatever I could learn from, you know, or just like a sponge trying to grab everything we could, you know. And nowadays it's all given to you, you know, it's like on a silver platter. And some of these kids, you know, they're amazing guitar players, you know, but I just feel like they lack, you know, direction and they lack the You know what? You know, I was just I was just having a chat with Mitch Perry yesterday. You know Mitch Perry? Um, maybe if I, you know, if I look oh, okay. Well, he's a he's a, a an excellent guitar player. He's well, maybe a few years older than us, <laughs> and he goes back to um, he played keyboards on Aerosmith Kings and Queens. Oh, awesome! And he, yeah, he never got credited on the session, but he goes back that far, and he's played for Edgar Winter. He's played for Sure. Wow. He's played for Michael Schenker, and anyway, you can imagine he's just like killer guitar player. Right. And we were talking about this yesterday and we both agreed that that guy Matteo Matteo what's his name I forget his second name not sure Matteo Brazilian guy Brazilian guy he's just incredible he's really incredible because I kind of felt the same way as you that uh, a lot of incredible they're lacking foundation they're lacking the the uh, the experience they're lacking the uh, um, the heart behind it. I think. Well, maybe not necessarily the heart, but I feel like they're they've really lost something having it all handed to them like that. You know that, and you know a lot of them are like great at what they do. You know, some of them are doing like all this stuff. You know, with both hands, but that's been done for years. You know, my friend played the Chapman stick. You know, so. That's not anything mm. really that impresses me. I mean, it's been around for a long time. You see a lot of the guys doing that, like Andy McKee and, you know, some of the kids these days. But 
it's not, you know, it's not unique. And uh, I mean, it's cool mm. that they developed it, you know, they've developed it a lot more, but, you know, so I just feel like they're really lacking that foundation, you know, and I, that's why I wanted to do this is because, you know, a lot of our heroes, you know, they're passing the torch, you know, what's going to happen after them, you know, and it's hard to, for me to adapt to the current music industry. Yeah, because, um, you know, I feel, I feel like, you know, musicians are just getting shit on and uh, not getting the credit that they deserve. And everybody wants to be famous. You know, everybody in their freaking mother wants to be, you know, famous. And, you know, you got to sift through all the garbage, you know, there's tons of garbage, uh-huh. you know. So it's hard to be a, a professional musician like yourself. And that is what his blood, sweat, and tears in your music, and basically. Well, uh, if I didn't have my, if I didn't have that Dio credit, I would be teaching or doing something. Well, no, I'd still be doing music, but I wouldn't be able to probably be doing the Rock Vault to Las Vegas show that I do because that's, you know, that's just having that credit. Yeah. Do you play with Dio Disciples too, or? No. No. Mm-mm. Did I did once? Oh, okay. Yeah, was Mark yeah. was Mark Bowles singing for them? That's yeah, that. yeah, no, he was. Yeah, yeah, and and he's also done the Rock Vault show, the, the one I do in Vegas. Yeah. Oh, that's cool, man. Yeah, he's one of my favorite Ingbe singers. You know. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I was just I was just listening to uh, trilogy. A couple of uh, Queen is in love or whatever it was I, just the other day. <laughs> you know, I love his voice. I got uh, I set it up with him because he's busy, but. Um, my music business teacher over at Musicians Institute has kind of guided me on this to help me, you know, get uh, get this going. And uh, he suggested that if, you know, you can't do the interview, you know, face to face, that he's like, send them over the questions, you know, let them answer the questions and, you know, whatever they're comfortable with, then they can fill it out, send it back to you. And I, I can include that, which I think is a great idea because it saves a lot of time. So, but, you know, and I just talked to Mark yesterday and, He's going to do that for me. He seems like a pretty cool guy, you know. Mm. Uh, but I, again, I think it's it's crucial that, you know, that uh, to do this because I feel like we really have to, um, that it's, you know, our responsibility to really leave that legacy, you know, for the younger generation. We mm. don't really have that true understanding of where everybody's coming from, you know, and where it comes from and developing your own voice, you know, and how that, you know, evolves and that you're not coming out of, you know, coming out of it like a fucking clone, you know, that uh, uh, just, you know, can play anything and everything, which I have friends that can do that. But as far as having their own true, unique voice. Mm. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. And it's like, when is there ever going to be another rock star? You know? And mm. uh, that to me just, it bothers me. Well, I was, I was just talking to, uh, to my friend Frank on the show. Frank Goldie? Um, Frank. Oh, Frank. Frank, um, yeah. uh, Frank uh, Hoffman, guy works on the show, uh, the rock, rock vault. And he has, he goes around and sees different bands and stuff. And he's, and he follows this one band called sex after uh, cigarettes after sex. And, um, no, none of us have, have heard of them. People like us, um, they've never been on a label, uh, to my knowledge, they've never been on a label, but they play to, um, two or 3000 people every night all over the world. That's good. You know, it's and, nice. uh, good. and, and, and it's a totally internet, um, sure. built on the internet, uh, you know, just for just, and, uh, and I listened to them and they sound kind of like Mazzy star and, uh, um, uh, Chris Isaacs, nothing not, to my ear, nothing too fresh. I mean, nothing too like, um, original, unique, original. Yeah. To, to, to my ear, but maybe I'm listening with the wrong ear. I don't know, but they're, they're huge and they were just built completely on the internet. So, I mean, they are, they're, they're these giant rock stars, you know? I guess. I, I guess I, yeah. you know, I I should research that more before I start running my mouth. <laughs> you know. Oh, I don't know. I I just. I yeah. uh, 
I just have this, you know, growing up like we did, you know, the era that we did. I just have a really sour taste in my mouth about how the uh, the music industry has turned out. And maybe a lot of mm-hmm. it right now is based on my own biased opinion, you know. So, uh, again, you know, I should probably do some more research before I, you know, start shutting off at the mouth. But. Well, it's weird. I, I always felt that, like, since the Internet came out, I felt it kind of sucked the creativity out of rock music yeah. i know that's a pretty that's a pretty heavy thing to say but like because just before the internet came out i remember you had like um these bands like um bjork and massive attack and um these really new sounds they were still new sounds um not that I've... even the early 2000s i i think it was yeah in a good direction in my opinion I like a lot of the bands that came from that era too. Um, like corn and stuff, right? Like corn. Yeah, absolutely. I remember you. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. and that was it was just before the internet. Yeah. Yeah, before it really, really took off. You know, I mean, there was still internet, but it wasn't like as big as it is now, where everybody. No. Completely Everyone's got their head in their. Yeah, totally. Everyone's got their head in their devices all day, including me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I do the same thing. You know, from the moment I wake up until the time I go to bed, and it's it's. You know, it's entertaining, I guess. And plus, you know, I use it a lot for networking, you know, with guys like you. Yeah. you know, and yeah. It keeps yeah. me inspired, too, because, you know, I I like to talk to people that are on that level, you know, um, that are successful or have been successful or at least have that mindset and that passion for music that I can relate to them, you know. Like I've been passionate about music since you know forever, and um, you know I, I'm not Joe Rockstar or, or whatever, but I feel like you know I'm at that level though. You know, I may have not had the you know the opportunities or whatever, but I feel like I'm up there. You know, and that because of that, I can relate to people like you a lot easier, and that's important to me to stay inspired is to interact with others with a similar mindset similar experiences you know i uh, i need that for me to keep going you know but on top of oh. by you know playing too but uh you know it really inspires me like talking to you like way back mm. you know, when i first started talking to you you like gave me some amazing advice oh you know? did i oh yeah absolutely That's nice to hear yeah, you gave me some amazing advice and talked to me about your experience with Dio and, you know, some of the things that he mentioned to you because you were young, you know, kind of directing you on your uh, your playing and your solos and uh, things of that nature on, you know, kind of uh, pushing yourself kind of beyond your own limits. But, uh, you know... Um, one thing that you told me that uh, was awesome was uh, staying focused, you know, every single day and focusing on, you know, the project and, you know, on all the, you know, the different areas of writing and, you know, the kind of the direction that you wanted it to go and the theme that you wanted, and, you know, that you just keep, you know, keep focused on that. And that's what I did, those guys. You know, we had a whiteboard. Where uh, every day, you know, we'd set ourselves, nice. up, you know, like stuff like that, you know, and, and it really helped with the direction like that, you know, and mm. it made me you know, like a light bulb went off in my head when you said that, when you told me that, you know, it's like, mm. this is how it's done, you know, it's not so fucking magical, you know, uh, thing. It's, I mean, it is magical, but I'm saying it's not like it's magic. It's just, you know, a, uh, it's just staying focused and, and, you know, really knowing what direction you're going to go with it. You explain that to me when you did the violence to myself. Yeah. Well, we, we were lucky enough in those days to be, um, when you, when you got a record deal back in the day, then it would keep the band alive for let's say a year or something. And you were, you could go into that rehearsal room five times, five days a week and it was your job. And, um, it, that's the only way that those good records, I think, were made. You know, like Leonard Skinner, the famous stories about Leonard Skinner, they were in that shed in the shack in the 
in the middle of the, the swamp or whatever it was for like you know a couple of years or whatever. Yeah, I read yeah. something about that or watched the thing about that, but yeah. So you guys have what like five days a week going in there for the violence? Oh yeah, life. yeah, yeah. Both, but yeah, Ronnie used to work six days a week, mm-hmm. uh, two till eight, whatever. So who was and, producing uh, that for you? Oh, the, 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 the Dio album? No, 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 no. For Violet's Demise. Are you guys oh, uh, the produ- the, yeah, the producer was Dave Jordan. Oh. And he came in and he came in right at the end uh, after we'd written the album. Um, and he came in and we auditioned for him. And then he said, I'll do it. And then he did pre production and then recorded us. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate. It never got released. Really? Yeah, I know. It would have. It would have done something. It definitely not probably. It wouldn't have been a big record because it would. It's not. It's not a commercial record, but it would have done something. Yeah, it would definitely have. You know, but I think it was the era too. That was probably. It was. It was. I mean, that, the, hard the, times calling it right. So well, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true because we we had that we had that smell of of uh, classic rock, you know, on us. Um, but. Uh, Bad. That kind of kind of made me think of what you were saying about it was the time because yeah. at that time, as difficult as it was, it was a very creative, very creative time. There was something in the air, like you know what I mean. I was, I, we were young, of course, we were all young, but but there was something in the air. It was a creative time. Oh yeah, that era. Um, that's uh, something that uh, you can't you know capture again. You know, and yes. it, it just comes down to the era. You know, you got people yeah. always saying, you know, I wish, you know, it was like that or this or that or whatever. Or we could make a record like we did back in 1989 or whatever, but it's not going to happen because it's just not the same vibe. It's not the same era. It's not the same feel, you know. So, where did your musical influences come from when you were growing up? Um, my influences. Um, How did you get involved? You know, in the playing. You know, so there two, was an, two questions in one. How's that? Oh well, there was an acoustic guitar in my house when I grew up, and I just picked it up and started messing around with it. And then it was like a family friend that had played, gave me some lessons, folk guitar. Basically, right. was the beginning of it, and then, and then the uh, uh, seeing Jimi Hendrix on tv is like oh. maybe like was okay. when i just had that I moment was like you, oh, you're g- uh i was gonna say you actually saw him what were you like a year old but i, I oh I no was, no this was yeah it was I like a video you. of so when you saw yeah. Hendrix, that kind of just blew your mind huh it was just like i was jumping around the room i was like uh what who is this what i gotta do this you know what i mean like oh. yeah he was way ahead of his time you know, and uh, I like a lot of his live stuff, like in Monterey, um, that album that he did. And that's just his uh-huh. playing on that was kick ass, you know. So that's what you really got inspired by is the uh, Hendrix. And then that was the one that that was the one where I had to get an electric guitar, yeah, totally. Because I started on acoustic. Yeah, did you learn on your own or did you start taking lessons more? You know, other than no, I, I like I said, it was a family friend that like showed me, like, you know, like. Oh, my dad should maybe show me like a one finger chord, you know, because he could play a couple of chords. And then, um, that's all. And then I got started. That's all I got. Prop- go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then I, and then I got a proper guitar lessons pretty young, probably like, um, 10, something like that, like cl- little classical pieces and folk pieces and stuff. And you learned how to read music and, uh, um, ne- I never really, I mean, like, I never, I, I, I know how to read it, but I never got any good at it because yeah. I just it didn't apply myself to it. Yeah, it takes a lot of practice. You know, like, even me, you know, it's like I'm still, you know, I, as many years of school as I had for music, I still, you know, it's like I have to go over the piece before I can actually play it, you know. And you got guys that on the spot don't be able to do it, you know. <laughs> my, my friend auditioned for, um, uh, Dave Letterman band way back in the oh, day. Oh wow! Yeah, he went, to, he went to Berkeley Music, right? Both him and his teacher at Berkeley auditioned for uh, Dave Letterman band. Paul Schaefer there, 
And uh, I guess like they didn't even ex- they didn't even allow you to go through the piece to just get familiar with it by looking at it. Even. They just wanted you to play like right on the spot, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't do that, you know? I can't. Mm. Do that. I, I've been reading music for a long time, but I'm still like within the first, you know, 10 fronts, maybe first five fronts that I'm mm. with beyond that. Mm. You know? But did you learn music theory uh, at some point? Or, I mean, you do yeah, I pick, yeah, I picked it up along the way. I never had formal music. My guitar lessons were like just pieces. He would teach me a piece and a piece. And then, but like I would pick up the music theory and then, and I got it. And then I started teaching guitar myself. And then I actually had to, and you know what, what really, one of the, one of the, one of the things that um, got my theory together was I started a duo with an ex-girlfriend, a girlfriend at the time who played fiddle. And we started a Django um, Grappelli duo. And uh, so I had to play through these charts. And so we we had like 50 songs or whatever. And of course, you've got to read through those charts pretty quickly, the chord changes. Yeah. And um, so I wouldn't get all the extensions, but I would get them, you know, some of the flat fives or the, you know, the dominant minor major sort of stuff. And uh, but playing them, actually gigging them live. Now, my understanding of chord changes is is so much better. Like, I can feel the chord changes. Oh, okay. You can hear what it needs to change. Yeah, like... Almost like when you're uh, driving a a stick shift, where you can just feel what it's about, what it needs to change. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I feel, that's right, you can feel the changes and improvise through two changes and stuff, and... Yeah, it's so, funny. I was on. I, we used to play at these old folks' homes because they remembered the actual music. They remember Duke Ellington and uh, on, on whatever. And, and um, we're playing through this song. I think it was a Duke Ellington song, and it was really complicated. And there was only two of us: me on guitar and her on fiddle. And I completely got lost, and I lost the plot. So of course, the thing fell apart. And um, I managed to sort of get back on the train, and then finish the song, and got through it, and then the. Um, the audience started clapping and clapping like this. And then there was silence. And in the silence, I hear this, this, this lady, this old lady go, well, the violin is good anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, back to you learning, you know, guitar, you know, obviously, I mean, you were 17 when Dio uh, had you, you know, join the band. So you must have been doing something right, you know, to get to that level at, you know, such an early age, you know? Um, so you think that had a lot to do with playing with the the, the duo thing, with the ex, with her playing fiddle and you doing the chord changes? Or like oh, a, um, a no, that's, that, that's, that's recent history, that is. That's that's only like 15 years ago, that that thing. Oh, okay. But back at, back when I was a kid, um, no, I just... I just uh, no, a good guitar. A good guitarist. I was a good guitarist as a kid. Yeah, it it's came. Right. It came. I was natural, natural guitarist just, as a kid. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the passion about it, right? So, did you learn a lot of stuff by ear, like the soloing and stuff? Yeah, most of the most of the stuff from like uh, Eddie Van Halen, Steve Vai, that sort of stuff. I worked out off the record, nice. and then and then I and then I had a t- teacher called Phil Hillborn who taught me. The Ingbe stuff. Oh, wow. That's awesome. And got the shred happening. Yeah, I absolutely love Ingbe. You know, ah, I, dude, I was just I was just watching some Ingbe like yesterday. He's still incredible. He's so good. I know. It's uh, and he does it, it's like effortless, you know? He ah, watches, he's killer. Watch him pick and it's like he he's barely moving his hand, you know? Uh, but I'm picking fast like that. You can see that I'm like picking fast. Him, he's barely barely moving and he's like just so much control it's like you know i've been trying to and and that. and there he is on stage i was watching him on stage just a video yesterday you know maybe from a few years ago and he's you know jumping around and he's interacting with the audience and he's he's throwing his hair around and his guitar around and he's just destroying the guitar <laughs> you know what i mean it's awesome 
know, yeah, he's definitely been, been a huge, I think, a, a huge inspiration to a lot of people that, you know. All of us, right? Yeah. yeah absolutely. I mean, because really that was, I mean, you've got, you've got Eddie and you've got Hendrix that really changed the guitar. I was but he, he did, he did two, didn't he? I mean, like, yeah, for, uh, for the Shredders. Yeah. Because nobody, nobody was playing like that, or maybe yeah. Alan Mueller or whatever, but Demi Ola didn't incorporate that with like rock music or metal mm-hmm. or anything. It's like, mm-hmm. to my knowledge, you know, and even, you know, Richie Blackburn, maybe he incorporated some, some of the classical, uh, you know, ideas into, you know, into Deep Purple or, uh, you know, or the other band he was in, but not like Ingbe, you know, he's like, no. Uh, no, like Blackmore's, Blackmore's kind of one of the the Page, the Clapton, they were kind of those era guitar players that, and they were all kind of different, but they were all awesome. Yeah, but Ingbe was his. Ingbe took that technique to just a different level, didn't he? Yeah, like Bach, he was like Bach on the guitar, you know, or Mozart or Paganini or whatever. And like that, I remember when I like first listened to his uh, album uh, "I'll See the Light Tonight," whatever one that is. Yeah, with 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 uh, that's uh, yeah yeah. Anyway, go on, yeah. So yeah, it was marching Jeff out Scott, or Jeff Scott Soto was on it. I think so. Uh-huh. So when I first listened to that, I was like, I couldn't comprehend it. You know, like you know, mm-hmm. it just didn't really make any sense to me. And then after a couple of years, you know, I'm playing guitar and stuff, and and then one day I listened to it, it just fucking blew my mind. Like holy shit, you know. Like it just floored me, and uh, I've been trying to play that way ever since, you know. And excuse me, and still, I you know I still have a problem with it, you know, like with the the picking and stuff. Because as mentioned, he's just he's so graceful. It's like you don't even put any effort into it. And I learned some cool shit from um, from Michael Badio. Uh, oh, he's great. I, I have the yeah. fortunate of hanging out with him quite a lot. Yeah, he's great. And he, uh, I did, um, uh, I revised the Starlets thing for Metal Method, you know, uh, you know, uh, way back in the early 90s, uh, Michael did the Starlets, right? And uh, he did all, all that handwritten, you know, so... I was talking to Doug Marks from Metal Method, who distributes that for Michael and stuff. And, you know, I told him that I, I you know, that looks like shit, you know, and that it needed uh, revising. So he asked me to do it and I revised it for him. And, and what did you, how did you revise it? Um, well, of course, you know, he had everything he had written. And, uh, okay. So I took, you know, basically the technology. That we have today, and I, I converted it to, you know, using like Sibelius, you know, and uh, you know the. Um, is that is that the video where he says the keys to the Lamborghini? Possibly, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, I but that one. I, I never realized. I never realized how amazing the guy was until I did. That. He, t- he told me a pretty cool story. He said that when he started with Nitro, they were in a club in. New York, I think, uh, or in the South, maybe. And there was no one in the audience. Completely de- a dead club. But there was one guy standing in front of him in the club with Dimebag Daryl. Oh, no, sh- no, Ted. Yeah. And Dime was like, yeah. <laughs> he loved him, apparently. Have you got to see Pantera with uh, Zach playing? Oh, no, I no, I should cool. like to see that. I love Zach. Zach's. Yeah. Awesome! He's fucking amazing. Yeah, I was like, I wanted to see them so bad. I had a chance to see uh, Dimebag with Damage Plan, right? Oh. Up in like Albany or whatever, because you know I yeah. live upstate, and uh, <laughs> they were playing at a club there. And I was like, oh, I'll see him next time around. Three days later, that's when they played in Ohio. With that shit happened, dude. You know, and it's just fucking. Blows my mind, but hey, I was so upset that I never got to see him play. Because he's one of my, he's one up there, you know, for me. He really is. Up, he really is up there. I mean, I couldn't agree more. He's just incredible. He was incredible. 
How was the uh, the tour that you did? By the way, you did a little tour. I saw. Yeah, I just just did one. It was good. It was good. Yeah, it was good. It was. Uh, we. Um, I've done it now four times now. We go to. I go to Europe once a year, pretty much, and um, it's obviously Dio themed. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, we we it, I did it with um, Doogie White okay. this this yeah, time. Doogie White. He sung guy? for. Yeah, he sung for Rainbow and for Schenker. Oh shit! So back in. Yeah, because it's the Dio theme. So we did some Rainbow and, and Dio oh, yeah, stuff. And that's why you were kind of, uh, you know, seemed very enthusiastic about him singing for you. You know, because I watched one of the interviews that you guys did, and you are like, oh, this is Doogie Boy, you know? Like, he's some big deal. And I was like, well, that was Doogie Boy, so he must be somebody important. But no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he, he did the, uh, he did, he did the uh, he's in the Temple of Rock with uh, Schenker. He's one of, the, one of the singers that Schenker has a, on the t- I think it's Temple of Rock, is it? Anyway, sure. he's one of the Schenker singers and and um and and Blackmore. How did you hook up with him? If you don't mind me asking. Not at all. No, the agent, this uh, guy Stefano, um, in Italy, he he said, he contacted him, knows him. And There's so, a, an Italian agent guy that I think. I think this the Italian agent guy that takes me out there. I think he did it because I probably started my YouTube channel. I've got a YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah, and I so I, I, I kind of put it out there as, as almost like a calling card because, you know, someone sees a video and they go, oh, you know, he's still out there sort of yeah, thing. That's cool. Yeah, it's uh, almost like word of mouth, you know. I know we're getting ready to wrap this up. Bro. I right. just really wanted to talk to you as a friend too, you know, from knowing you, I'm talking to you for so many years. So, uh, you know, it could have been more focused and it's my fault because I've been going on tangents, but... Thank you so much, Rowan, for your time, buddy. It's been a pleasure, man. Okay, bud. Thank you, Rowan. My pleasure. Nice nice talking to you, man. I'll talk to you later. It's been nice. Thank you, Rowan. Take care.